Hello everybody, my name is James Munro and I'm going to present to you today on leveraging Python and open source for data science on the buy side. Before I get any further though, I need to show you these two slides of important information. If you'd like to read them, please pause the video. Okay. So just to introduce myself first, uh, I've been working in finance for about 10 years, uh, all of which was at being at Man Group. Before that, I was a physicist. Over the last 10 years, I've worked in a number of quant development teams and I've run a number of quant development teams for AHL. And the last two years, I've been CTO for Man AHL. So over that period as well, over the last 10 years, uh, the story has mostly been a Python one. Uh, for me and my team. So I'll talk a little bit about why we use Python. It's not just because of data science. I'll talk about the open source story for us, what matters for us in industry. And then I'll talk about how those, uh, or how those address the problem that we're trying to solve, which is delivering research ideas and then delivering those into production, into trading. I'd mention briefly uh, some of the compute requirements around that and uh, what we've learned there, and then how we connect simulation or the back test, the, uh, the test of your model and trading the model and how we connect those two things. Then I'll also talk a bit about the story we've seen around data over the last five and six years, which makes this data science interesting area so interesting right now. Man Group is a global investment management firm focused on delivering performance for its clients. We're a set of diverse in investment specialists. These include AHL, Numeric, GLG, GPM, and FRM. AHL, the one I've been working with, is a fully systematic investment manager. Amongst other things, that means everything is fully automated from data through to trading. AHL has been around for over 30 years and has over $35 billion of AUM at the moment. Numeric is more of a fundamentally driven quantitative asset manager. They have both long only and alternative equity and credit strategies. And they're based, based in Boston. GLG is a discretionary investment manager. So they're focused much more on human interaction and making decisions, humans making decisions based on rich data and sometimes the quantitative techniques as well. GPM, whilst uh, GPM is a private markets investment manager. They do things like real estate and debt. FRM is more of an advisor. They're an investment specialist. They provide managed accounts, commingled co -mingle strategies, and other advisory relationships. Um, AHL is very technology focused um, and much of the front office uh, groups are as well. But AHL has got a long track record here. We do a whole bunch of things in this area. We sponsor this conference um, and we also sponsor the London monthly meetups, at least when they do happen. Unfortunately, obviously that hasn't been so possible this year, but the monthly meetups in London happen in an auditorium across the road from us normally. We have fancy technology in the office, like this liquid cooled uh, machine learning desk. Uh, we have fancy technology in the data centers as well. And we support uh, things like uh, coding competitions and hackathons. Uh, we have external speakers coming to talk to us and we support lots of open source. So what's the story with Python and us? Uh, so Python we adopted not long after I joined the company. And at that time, it, it wasn't peerless when it comes to data science. I think it is now, but it wasn't peerless back then. It was very much a competitor with MATLAB and R and maybe a few other things. Uh, but it was much more about the wider set of use cases that it helps us solve. Things like doing data transformation, loading uh, with its wise support of databases, all the good data web service tools, um, the way it would be good in production and helping us to write our trading systems, except for where things are low latency or need more high performance stuff. Visualization of reporting and batch jobs have all been good use cases for Python as well. So for us, it was much more 
of a general story. Now, I, do, I think we're really happy with the choice, given it's super and first class as a data science language as well. And if we were asked at the moment, or if we were to evaluate other languages like Julia, uh, I think it would be because of the missing development tooling and some of these other use cases that maybe aren't, whilst they're possible in the language, maybe aren't as so well supported by the wide range of open source technology available. Okay, so there are a couple of practices that we use internally that helps us sort of deal with Python at scale. And I think, um, you know, especially continuous integration and Python really go hand in hand because of this weakness around refactoring Python. Um, because it's a dynamically typed language, you really need to be testing your code all the time. You really need to be integrating your changes all the time because you need that, because you need to know that your changes you do make continue to work for everyone. So continuous integration is a key practice for us. And given the um, scale of the operation here, where we're approaching 7 million lines of Python, uh, hundreds of builds, um, we need to keep merging those changes and we need to keep maintaining all of that code. And we saw this was valuable uh, recently when we moved to Python 3 a few years ago. And uh, that really helped us out being able to make changes across tens of thousands of files and make sure that everything still worked. So continuous integration is about merging your changes in op frequently. It's about automating the build and running the tests all the time. Continuous deployment is more about being ready to release all the time, not using long lived branches or having long lived uh, gap between what you're developing and what you have in production. It's about automating as much as possible. Whilst we're not completely automated to production, it's definitely a goal. And uh, we've got very close now where we just change a config file and the new version of the code runs in production. So, and we also try to release as much as possible. And that's a key uh, payoff for us. That we're continuously changing, not just the build, but all the way to production and continuously integrating our changes. It allows us to keep up with the state of the art. Another thing is that we've actually trialed, you know, almost 900 open source packages for Python, which just makes it, and we don't use nearly that many, but we do use hundreds of packages that are open source, and it just makes it a really good base to work from. And that's really the first inevitable thing about um, Python, Linux, and a data science stack is that you're inevitably using open source. And culturally as well, uh, I think there's an advantage, you know, in some places there's this not invented here syndrome, but there's an advantage um, when you're willing to use high quality tools invented externally and willing to figure out how to plug them together, willing to understand why they exist and what use they serve. And because of uh, things like standardization of licenses, it's so easy to try all this stuff, um, much easier than with proprietary tools where you have to get demos, trial licenses. So open source is just the way to go for trialing software. Um, and then you also, I think, get this advantage about separation of concerns. Uh, it used to be the case that you'd get these massive sort of stacks of technology delivered by places like Sun, Microsoft. Then you'd build everything else internally. Nowadays, you can build things out of almost like Lego with all these open source tools. That's been a real advantage for us as well. And then you also get people who know what they're doing because they've used Pandas, NumPy before, et cetera. What does this look like for us? Well, we see uh, open source permeating a lot of the stacks. Obviously, there's the putting it all together at the top of the stack. That means we're delivering our, our own tools our own analytics, our own visualizations, and, and in particular, our own data platform. But most of the bottom layers of the stack are really well serviced by open source now. And we see this rising tide, <clears throat> excuse me, we see this rising tide of open source technology uh, all through the layers, you know, from compute to storage, process management, we're running a large compute cluster with Spark, all the Python development tooling, all the open source libraries reaching higher and higher levels of abstraction. You know, in the data platform now, we have things like Apache Beam helping us to run our data pipeline. And, we're in, and whilst a numerical optimizers um, 
probably still the best there of proprietary. We're getting, you know, better and better numerical optimizers available as open source tools. And whilst a lot of the quant tooling we have for, say, pricing asset classes uh, will be proprietary, or they'll be our own, uh, we are seeing quite, you know, more and more quant tooling available uh, open source as well. Okay. So then there's also contributing to open source. And one is just, just the ability to give back is awesome. Um, it's not quite a monetization thing for us uh, because it's not, you know, our business to open source things. It's our business to make money for our clients. So whereas other companies might open source something to help seed adoption, to help get buy-in from developers around the world, that's not really a thing for us, but it just means that we're giving back instead. Um, but there are advantages for us as well. It's not it's not um, just about us being charitable here. We are not maintaining patches internally. We'd rather contribute upstream in the source package. That reduces our own tech debt. We get better separation of concerns um, when we can use upstream packages, um, which we help support, or where we open source our own packages. It helps enforce separation from your own infrastructure. And it helps you separate out what you're doing. So you deliver a package which does something in particular. Uh, you get help, obviously, if you open source packages, other people will contribute and they're able to fork and take it in their own direction that they like as well. And, you know, if people are using Pandas and your own tools, uh, then that helps skill people up and it helps you hire the best talent. So just a few examples of things we have open sourced. There's Detail, uh, which is a Pandas, uh, slicer and dicer visualizer and gives you basic, basic statistics as well. You can run it from notebooks. You can run it independently. Notebooker is a way to trivially go from notebooks to a reporting system. It uses uh, the Netflix library that helps you prioritize notebooks to pass arguments in. So you can say, for instance, run a notebook for a different model prioritization, a different market in our case might be another example of where you'd add a parameter to a notebook and generate reports and you can generate beautiful reports because you can shrink the code out the way and just have the formatted report of the notebook. Partial testing helps us with our continuous integration story. We record the coverage from the tests and then we only run the tests that change that you need to run because your code has changed. Arctic is an open source tool that uh, is based on our tool that we use internally to store tick data and time series data. There's not, I don't think there's a lot of good solutions for tick storage out there in the open source world. Arctic is one of them, um, is one of the good solutions. Adero is an internal app we use uh, for 360 feedback and helping to develop the team that's now open source so, so everyone can use it. PyTest plugins is one of my favorites as a professional Python developer. You write a lot of tests, you're doing integration testing. You need to fixture that with the right tools. It might be databases, might be web servers, might be Git repositories, might be virtual environments. This will let you do that in a very small number of lines of code, often just a decorator on the test function. Okay, so what's the problem we're trying to solve here? Well, we're basically trying to go from idea to production um, and we're trying to prove it's valuable. We're trying to develop that idea and then we have to go through this process of implementing it and trading it. So you've got some new idea, some new data. The research step takes some in-sample part of that data and then lets the quant or researcher or data scientist work on that data, figure out what's valuable. Once there's an idea there that we think we could trade, we, excuse me, we take it to a review phase. That's where you use out-of-sample data compare it to the in-sample results, compare it to a threshold that you set, and then you may discard the idea or you may continue to implementation. This in-sample, out-sample process is not something that just happens in academia. This is a critical for getting the answer right in the real world as well. There's such a risk of overfitting here. Implementation is where we take that, you know, maybe a script, a simulation of what could happen, and we uh, make it possible to run that thing in production uh, 24 hours a day, completely unattended, uh, and uh, with all the necessary diagnostics we need to check it's working properly. 
We then trade that thing. And it's important to include this trade step in this iterative process because it's something that's constantly reviewed. So there's whether the model actually predicts outcomes in the market. And there's also whether our simulation or what we wanted to trade matches production. So those two factors are continuously monitored after we take it into production. Then the process whole starts again. And this, you can think of this as hierarchical as well. So you may construct a new fund as a top level idea. It might be formed of several smaller ideas. Those smaller ideas would be projects for quantitative researchers. And those, I, those researchers will, you know, every day go through this kind of loop, a shorter version of this loop as they try and develop these ideas. And then in the end of the day, you're delivering this stuff into a trading system. Trading systems join these other bits together. They take data from vendors, pricing, other sorts of data. They send orders to the market. Once those orders are filled, those fills need to be recorded very carefully in a books and records system, so-called the back office. And then we also pull diagnostics out of this blue box because we don't want this blue box to be a black box. We want to be able to introspect it. We want to see what's happening because it's only through understanding what's happening that we can improve it. If we drill into this blue box, uh, you can think of it as a pipeline internally. Now, this pipeline may be extremely tight for like a HFT firm or it may be quite extensive for a large bank or for large asset managers. It starts with data. So it comes in from the street, from the internet, and then it's transformed, normalized and processed, ready for prediction step. That signal generation is a prediction step. But once you have a prediction on a market, you need to combine it with all those markets. You need to understand where each fund is at, what positions they can hold. You need to understand where your limits are. So there's this whole trade generation and optimization step. You need to understand how to get to your target position most efficiently. That optimization step is therefore also critical. Order management is all about risk limits, regulatory limits, um, making sure that the fund gets what it needs, making sure uh, that, uh, that we meet any exchange limits. It's all about the constraints of the system. And it's more like a checking process. Once it passes through order management, goes to execution and execution's job is to fill that order as cheaply as possible. So if you think about it there, there are actually three places quant models exist in trading systems. Well, there's a fourth, um, but I haven't really touched on it here in that the way, but, and you could consider it part of signal generation as well. It's how you go from data to something you can use. You could consider, for instance, natural language processing as a fourth step in the data. I've, I've assumed that that's part of signal generation here. Signal generation is just about predicting individual markets, if you like, or collections of markets. Trade generation, um, because there's op lots of optimization and it's not, um, there's not one way to do it. It's a, uh, it's a step you need to optimize yourself, a step that you need to understand and improve yourself. That is a quant models there as well. And then an execution, a uh, much tighter loop there, but it's all about how you how you do that much tighter loop, low latency loop of getting data from the market, deciding how to get the rest of the order into the market as cheaply as possible. The execution algorithm. Okay. So those quant models, right, they need consistent APIs so that you can deliver lots and lots of them into production. So you can think of that as like a quant container. You've got ways to submit orders. You've got ways to get data. You've got risk management controls. You've got configuration, which might include weights to markets, weights to signals, even model parameters that you might be refitting on some um, schedule. You've got diagnostics that are coming out that you're using to understand whether the model's working correctly. And you might be requesting com compute from things like Spark clusters, which we have in research and trading. So this idea of a quant container, and it's the way you deliver your strategies to production, and you have uh, many surrounding systems that support this process. So I've mentioned simulation a few times, and uh, there's a particular way we think about simulation and trading. And really, we try and make the code be shared. Some companies will take a Python script generated by an analyst or something, you know, whatever language they've used, and they might have several languages they're analysts using. And they'll rewrite it in C++ or Java. 
And if you're trying to do data science, if you're trying to do machine learning, that can be really complicated because you might not have the right level of machine learning tooling in that language. We've definitely taken the approach for that reason and for the reason of actually having an interpretable system that your quants can also read. They can look at prod code and see what it does of not recoding, of just sort of taking that existing code and making sure it's fit for production. And that correspondence we see all the way through the stack as well. So we try and use the same data where we can. Sometimes you can't because you've bought historical data, but you're collecting live data. But as much as possible, it's a match. API can be the same though. We can definitely have the same code for signal generation. For order management, now there can be an extensive order management system. Might be too slow to run for simulation. You need your simulations to be fast, but the calculation could be the same. Execution, obviously you're not really trading for simulation, but you can take the commissions. You can take the data where you've learned about the market impact from each trade, how much it costs to trade each market, and you can use that in your simulation and get really accurate results for how much your trade execution costs are. So all of this needs a relatively extensive compute system, some of which is possible to put in the cloud, some of which is not. Uh, one of the things the cloud's not great at is high performance compute clusters. So whilst you can scale up sort of map reduce jobs in the cloud, um, not every job is amenable to that. And it's useful to have high performance compute available for your researchers. Ideally, you want your researchers to think there's infinite compute available such that they can just do the job that they need to do to develop the best possible models. So we have thousands of calls. This is actually an image from last year. I think we've probably doubled the size of our cluster since then. Thousands of calls and tens of terabytes of memory available for researchers to use. Another key aspect there is to have fast storage. You might think with this data, the growth of data, well, that's okay because data's got cheaper to store. But you can't just have data, a data storage system which is as slow as the previous generation. You also need to have faster data storage because you need to get through that more extensive data faster to do the job. Okay, so one example of um, traditional data, if you like, is just price data. Well, that's here, tick data here. And uh, this is kind of a well-known problem in finance and well-addressed. Uh, there are systems for collecting billions of ticks a day that we run. And uh, in fact, this year, we saw over 3 billion ticks during March, during when that pandemic, uh, the news of the pandemic really started to affect the markets. And, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for us to see more than 2 billion ticks a day this year with all the volatility. So price data, fairly well understood problem, um, still quite an extensive uh, challenge. Here, for instance, a uh, nice feature of this plot is you can see when markets open. So Asia opening here early in the morning, uh, and then further countries in Asia before Europe opens here at eight o'clock, and then the US opens at 2.30 p.m. our time. So you can see the pattern of price data throughout the day and when it comes in. However, the story over the last five or six years has been about a sort of growth of types of data set that are amenable to be used for prediction, both because there's new data sets being collected and sold, and because we have new methods, you know, methods that allows us to use text data, images, other sorts of data. So we have things like weather data, credit card transactions, news, review data, and we can use all of that data now uh, to try and predict markets. One of the key challenges though, is uh, actually mapping that data back to what you might trade. So you might have data on suppliers for a company, maybe Samsung or LG are su supplying Apple with displays, I don't know. Maybe that's changing through time. Maybe su Samsung's going away and the new iPhone uses a different type of display. So that data, therefore, you might be collecting that across a whole bunch of companies. So you might trade Apple directly through its common stock that would be listed on an exchange, and you need to know where it's listed to send it uh, to trade. Uh, and you may have a number of ID IDs for that common stock, different data providers use like Bloomberg or a common ID like CDOL or internal IDs. Or instead of trading the stock directly, or tra you might trade the option on the stock or you might trade it as part of a collection of data that you've got 
for the index for the S&P 500. You might trade the future or the option on the future. Or the common stock might be, a mem might be part of an ETF portfolio and you might trade the option on that. So there's just so much going on here with how you might trade something. And also how you have to go from what might be relatively unstructured data with strings, which might include company names, might include the products of the company and not the company name, like iPhone for Apple. Uh, mapping that all back to the thing you might actually trade. And this is all a time series, right? This is a snapshot here. But in reality, this is changing through time. And if you're holding hundreds or thousands of positions, this is something that becomes a management problem that you have to solve. And it's not something your data vendors are best apt at because you're joining all this data yourself. Okay. The Eagle Alpha is like a connector or aggregator of data. And this is kind of the growth they've seen in the number of data sets they've indexed. And it's all sorts of things. You can see, you know, um, ESG data, employment data, sentiment data, and it's really grown over the last five or six years, the amount of data that is available in the market. And that's one of the key stories for us as well. Uh, if you wanted more evidence, here we go. We've got a number of jobs available on the left here and how that's grown up to 2018. It would have grown more over the last couple of years as well. And then the amount of data spending on the buy side, that's grown. And I know these are estimates, this data is a bit old, but really it has grown that much, I can guarantee it. So the, uh, this has been a real key story. So together we have this sort of data science story. Let me conclude for you. We have this data science story that we've seen expand over the last five, six years. Last 10 years, in part, we've seen Python be a key tool for that. And we've seen open source being a key tool for that. Uh, internally, and that's helped us address a uh, trading system and getting quant models into the trading system. And now with the explosion of data, we have many more of these quant models to deploy. And so we're really leveraging those technologies um, to, to help us solve that problem. I also touched on compute and uh, the nature of our relationship with simulation and trading. Um, and talked a bit about the company as well. So I hope that was interesting. Um, I hope that has been a little bit of a uh, insight into this part of the industry. If you'd like to learn more, then uh, please go to the AHL website or the MAN website. The AHL website has uh, videos that tell, a, tell you a lot about what we've been doing. MAN Institute on the MAN website uh, has investment management video uh, articles and videos and podcasts. Uh, if you're interested in that, there's also technology articles. Please go to GitHub, have a look at our open source offering, and please follow us on MAN Contact. Thank you very much for listening. Have a good day and uh, stay safe.